roll 37, sound roll 12. Ray Bradbury, take one. <laughs> There could only be one man who would have a place like this, and it would have to be Ray Bradbury. What an honor to meet Good, you, sir. Thank, thank you very much. After all the Good. stories in the years, the pulp magazines and the slicks that I've read, the hard covers. Well, your introduction reminds me of a day I went back to my hometown, Waukegan, and I walked up on the lawn of my grandparents' house and picked a dandelion. And a woman came out on the porch and looked down at me and said, if I see a strange man picking a dandelion on my lawn, it's got to be Ray Bradbury. Oh, oh, I said, it. yes, ma'am. <laughs> A quote here. You say you've written every day, at least I've read this and you've told me this, I think for the last 50 years. Um, and if you get to a typewriter by 9 o'clock uh, in the morning, by 10.30 a.m., you're protected against the world. That's right. Now tell me about that. Well, we're surrounded by reality, aren't we? And a lot of people think I don't pay attention, but which of course I do. I've been watching Beijing the last two weeks and crying as much as any of us. How can you not sit in front of the screen oh. and have tears burst from your eyes? It's so terrible. Yeah. And you don't even know the people, do you? But they're there, and you yeah. do know them. Yeah. So my job is to do two things, not only get you through the night, but get you through the day, which is even more important. So if I can find the metaphors to apply to terrible problems uh, without pontificating, without trying to change you, my metaphor, if it's good enough, can help you. American Splendor <clears throat> is a... Uh, is a, looks like a comic book, but the content is not typical of by any means of comic books. Uh, I use <clears throat> frames you know, or, or panels and I you know, put dialogue in balloons and thoughts in balloons, but it's a realistic comic book. It's autobiographical and uh, it deals with mundane events that most writers, not only comic book writers, but fiction writers as well and possibly autobiography writers uh, consider too mundane to deal with. Oh, American Splendor, because I get to read about myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, find out what I've been doing and things like that. We all consider ourselves to be masters of our environment. But change the rules just a little and things can get very scary. For example, we've all said, ooh, is there a bee on me? But how many of us have ever got to say, ooh, Am I on a bee? Amy? Nick? Amy? What is it? Sounds like mom. Sounds more like a swarm of... Whether you're dealing with a real environment or an imaginary environment, it has to have rules, cause and effect, ecosystems, things intertwine. The environment shapes us while we also shape our environment. Now, no story ever presented an environment that's as complicated and, and thought out as the entire Earth really is, with all its different nationalities, wars, countries, hatreds, religions, and intertwined ecosystem, but that's okay. The environment in a story only needs the elements that are used in the story to tell the tale. The environment creates a story, the story creates the environment. For example, I'm not wearing any pants right now, but that's okay, that's just subtext and motivation. Okay, I, I think I'm starting to lose you. Listen, uh, it's lonely up here, so drop me a line, let me know you're alive. Mail me a videotape, I'll put you on the air with me here, it'll be great. Even just phone TVO, tell them what you think, how we're doing. So long, prisoners of gravity. So long. I'm always watching you, but I'll never look down on you. Oh, that was nice.
Response. Response. 